Hi there, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Today we're continuing on with key discussions and the focus, the importance of Don Hatley's place of living, or should I say, former place of living, his abandoned trailer, which you could say has been neglected in a way. It's not received the true attention it fully deserves compared to the likes of Brenner's burnt down trailer across the border. When it comes to investigating the Dylan Rounds case, that's what I want to look at today and go in a little bit further. So make sure to stick around from start to finish. And if, if there is time, I'll refer back to that whole rant situation where people were making invalid points in the past and I wanted to clear things up. Hopefully I can fit it in today. In addition to kick things off, we can look back at the comments of the last video that I did to acknowledge points there, what people had to say about Don Hartley's trailer, whether they think it's important or not, and see if there's any questions that need answering. So that's what we can do today. Welcome to everybody that is watching this live premiere and those in the background. Feel free to share your thoughts, opinions, reactions in the live chat box on the right hand side of the screen. And everyone in general, if you've got any questions or any key points you want to mention or elaborate on, make sure to leave a comment down below under this video. In the comment section pinned, you'll find one by me with some additional links if you want to check those out, if you want to support the channel in alternative ways, um, it's all there. If you want to catch up on the last video that I did about the uh, Dylan Rounds case, top right corner of the screen, click on the I symbol and you'll find it there and feel free to check on that when you've got time. Before we go any further, just want to say big shout out to Maria, of course Maria, for her presence, her super chat last night, or two, which is very good of her, and uh, skeptical as well. Um, there's been a, a few issues in recent times, supposedly, when it comes to super chats or super stickers, whatever that may be, mobile or in general, but we can refer to that a bit later on. For now, let's just get into the Dylan Rounds discussions and focus on the theme of Don Hatley's trailer and catch up with those comments. I'll just adjust it to the latest comments. So below, me personally, I was referring to the blood on Don's trailer, saying that I've never heard of it before. As for responses, Cleo trying to recall, skeptical on Don's trailer, never heard that before, never heard anything happening at Don H's property by LE. So there was things done at his property, such as the police going on down to investigate, look about, and, you know, there's firearms over in that direction. But I think that's mainly it. I don't think they treated Don's place as a key hotspot in relation to the disappearance of Dylan Rounds, which is very unfortunate, to be honest, and it'll make a bit more sense later. June Hare saying, around two weeks ago, another channel said he got permission to go on the property and inside Brenner's trailer, flew a drone, don't like the channel, but I did watch it, nothing said about blood. Okay, so, to clear that up, June, two weeks ago, that channel, what you're referring to, is called Profiling Evil. A guy that, uh, prior to that, did an interview with Candice Cooley about updates and what's coming next, which is the Dr. Phil episode, whenever that is. And then the next video that followed on Profiling Evil's channel is what you're referring to. He went on down to get drone footage so he could pass it on to Dr. Phil for that Dylan Rounds episode, okay? That was the reason behind doing that. But in terms of getting permission onto the property, I believe it was the grain shed property and Dylan's farm, it had nothing to do with Don Hatley's trailer. It's got nothing to do with profiling evil, visiting Don Hatley's place because that's still classified as private and he didn't go in that direction because there was no need to. And it's just not been put as a hotspot or on the map as a place that needs searching or has been searched. So it's kind of got forgotten about. That's why the family and even this guy haven't gone over in that direction, but they could be missing out on a key opportunity. You never know, right? And yeah, in terms of Brenner's trailer... It's not Brenner's trailer, okay? So just to clear that up, June, when Profiling Evil went down there and he went to supposedly Brenner's trailer, that home 
RV, that mobile RV. Um, that was supposedly Ed Harshberger's or Ed Harshbarger's. It was his. And Brenner was allowed to use it himself in the early days of moving on into Lucid, right? Getting started. Fast forward onwards, Dylan Rounds then bought Brenner a trailer. So Brenner could have his own trailer and stay in it for as long as he wanted instead of borrowing somebody else's ads, okay? So when Profiling Evil went down to the area, Brenner's trailer wasn't there because in the past it was taken away by police as a part of the investigation, okay? But what did remain was the mobile home RV, which supposedly belongs to Ed, but Brenner did use in the early days. Did it have any of Brenner's personal possessions inside? Maybe. Um, there was a few comments as well, and one person was saying, no, nope, that's the wrong trailer. And then Profiling Evil responded back saying, well, from my sources and information, this is the one. And it also had papers in when Brenner was rummaging about or something for documents. I can't quite remember the context of it all, but it's just from what I can remember, right? So Brenner's personal trailer taken away. Profiling Evil went into the RV, RV home, RV trailer, whatever you want to call it, which belongs to Ed and Brenner used temporarily. So it doesn't have as much significance within the case, right? And I guess as well that Brenner's personal trailer, the one that Dylan bought him, the one that was taken away by the police, was likely the same trailer in which that time-lapse footage appeared of uh, Brenner in his own trailer cleaning a gun with blood on him and some of D uh, Dylan's DNA upon that shirt, which was later confirmed by the police when they found it in the trailer. So that's probably one of the key reasons as to, well, one of them, at least, the reasons to why it was taken away, because it's a personal possession of Brenner's and it was used, and there was incriminating evidence on the inside of the trailer with what was found, the, the shirt and the time-lapse footage, which was later figured out. So it does hold quite a bit of importance, that trailer. And obviously you can understand important areas, places of interest, important people, important items and events found or which have occurred in a spot, there'll be a greater level of concentration on it and, well, a form of care taken, right? But in terms of Don Hatley's trailer, besides the firearms being found there, which is unrelated, like an unrelated crime charge to the Dylan Rounds case, it's treated as separate, right? But it should be treated with equal importance considering it's a part of the timeline of Dylan's outcome and fate because with Brenner going down to Don's place supposedly on the day he took Dylan rounds out, you'd think, well, I wonder what happened up that way in that direction then, okay? We're following all the traces and, you know, pieces of the, the jigsaw. Why not go off in that direction then? You never know. Obviously, in that direction before... Yeah, before Don's place, can't remember how much mileage and distance, but almost like just before the start of the private road, which goes down to Don's place, it was Ty Corbin that mentioned another person found a John Deere hat half buried in the ground in the mud. And that was found, when was it now? Probably 2023 onwards. Wasn't found by the family wasn't found by the police? Is that because they weren't going off in that direction? Maybe. I mean, was it confirmed to be of Dylan's, that John Deere hat? No, never got an answer, never got an update, nothing. And Ty Corbin said himself, when you report something into the police, such as evidence, they never call you back. They never let you know. Well, that's a bit of a contradiction by Ty Corbin. Because in the past, when Ty Corbin Lance Kelly reported in the bag of bones, the police did get back to them. 
and it turned out it was just animal bones and an unknown bone. Right, you remember that? So the police reported back on that, and yet Ty Corbin says the police will never respond back about anything if you've called it in. Well, clear and obvious contradiction, right? I don't think enough people pick up on that, but I did really early on. So was there anything else to acknowledge here? Hopefully I cleared it up June in terms of what was said there. So in other ways of putting it, where the supposed blood was found on the trailer of Don's was not in the same place as where Profiling Evil went down. And that the trailer that Profiling Profiling Evil went in is the temporary trailer which was used by Breno when he borrowed it from Ed to stay in until he was gifted one by Dylan. Okay? June says, you guys would have to watch it yourselves if I missed it. Right, so I think she's referring to this comment back here, but we've cleared all that up now. We've got clear there. Inspector Gadgets, this is not Warlight Rent channel. That's true. So this person is just basically saying how the videos that I do make aren't rants, but they're valid points and discussions, etc. So that's good to see. June says, when a story first comes out, I always remember what people say. As things go on, the story changes. Usually their first statements are true. Okay. I can kind of understand that. It goes one of two ways, right? You might have the base story and foundations of what happened and how things played out. And then with time, it might grow in depth, in reach, in different leads, and if it's all done correctly and true, more's revealed with time and it follows a consistent base and pattern. But with the Dylan Rounds case, what's ended up happening is you got the original story, people not in much disagreement at the start, I wouldn't say, I think it was all right, but then give it a few weeks, that's when it started going a bit wrong and then with the Jim Terry situation and being fired there and having a bit of a grudge against the family, more so Candace Cooley, and I guess just in rounds a bit, things started kicking off. And that's when the audience members came on in, right, from all all over the place. All the audience members came on in from the Jim Terry's channel, formed the community there, from the Pancakes perspective, formed there, then bringing in some fellow people and supposed guests, Kurt Wadsworth, etc., Taylina, etc., and then it's just started bubbling away and the cracks started appearing. All these other alternative stories and realities coming out in parallel to the ongoing investigation with the insiders working on it. But as for the stories, it didn't quite add up together. So there was a lot of friction, right? What didn't help, though, was within. Whether it be police, whether it be the way Candice Cooley was wording it, right? Things were switching and changing. So it was hard to follow and keep up with. And for others, for some, it got frustrating. But like this is the thing common sense would say. From the very beginning, you're going to have limited knowledge about the case or a situation. You only know so much from the beginning. And then with time, it should branch out and you should get a better understanding. And you might find more evidence which tells the story better. But... I guess with Dylan Rounds is everything that happened or everything that we learned was within the first week of it all unfolding as described by Candace Cooley and Justin Rounds didn't disagree. He nodded his head. So that's what it seems to be. Now, in terms of like the timelines or the phone ping videos where I've told the story of how things unfolded, most of which could well tie in with the original statement of everything that we learn and what was understood all happened within the first week everything after that was just delays dragged out and the process of trying to search for Dylan right so maybe the the first week of it all unfolding is trying to make sense of what's happened in the first place then coming across the evidence then potential foul play then some of the stories not adding up and lies by Brenner then adding one thing with another and things being confirmed in the background by police here and there, when stuff's been taken to the lab or so, right? Yeah, you're learning about what's happened to Dylan. Is he simply missing, or has he been murdered, right? And then what happens after that point? 
well, it's, it's the process of just searching for Dylan. Are you searching for any more answers? Well, you might come across some along the way, but to be honest, the way it's been told right, to the public from Candice Cooley, Justin Round's perspective for the news interviews, it wasn't all talked about at once, was it? Right? It might have been referred to here and there as everything what we've learned was in the first week. But let's just acknowledge a side point, which is like a counterpoint, really, is that November 14th or so, that's when the police heard about the forensic dive on Dylan's phone, which had the time lapse of Brenner cleaning a gun with blood on him and DNA on, on the shirt, which belongs to Dylan, later confirmed by police when they found the shirt, right? That's groundbreaking. But it didn't happen within the first week. It happened in November, months, months later. So, and that told another story, almost like an add-on from, you know, the events playing out as on the 28th, Dylan woke up, did this, did that, made a call here, went down there, and that was it. What happened then? Then the phone pings. Well, Dylan, here, there, phone ping here, there, presumably, or assuming Brenner's in possession of it at this point, let's just say. But then how does it reinforce it? Because you need a little bit more besides those phone pings. You need some kind of surveillance or footage or some kind of material, a photo, which matches up with a certain timestamp, which matches up with the phone pings and the times. And it was November, months later, which really filled the picture more visually and, I guess, factually, if you want to call it that. So uh, November 14th. Time-lapse footage showing Brenner in the trailer, 7.27 a.m. So it would mean that after 7.27, that's when Brenner was likely in possession of Dylan's phone because he already is at 7.27. And before 7.27 is obviously the end of Dylan's life. That's how you'd work it out from the looks of it. Maybe some people in the background are awkward. Oh, it's not enough. We need more evidence. We need more proof. Well, they're the police. The family seems somewhat satisfied by it. The, I guess the court as well. So, you know, what more do you want? And of course, more things can be found along the way, just at a slower pace. And stretched out over time, Candice Cooley, just in rounds with the interviews, did talk more about the story of how things played out and referring back to original points or things in the early days of what happened. But it was never mentioned at the very beginning. It was mentioned later on. Kind of like the situation of Don Hatley, supposedly, as a red flag, giving Candice Cooley the green lights to report Dylan's missing. And Candice Cooley was like, uh, why do we need permission from you? That sounds a bit of a red flag. And then the other red flag. And I think this was all from the documentary as well, to be honest, which, you know, came out with time. It wasn't at the start. Um, the other red flag was Brenner peeking out of his trailer around the door or through the window as Heavy D in the helicopter was flying on over. Looked like he was, you know, being cautious, didn't want to be seen on camera, wondering why it was, looking suspicious. But normally most people, if they didn't have anything to hide, would pop their head out of the trailer and show themselves to see what was going on in the sky. But Brenner was more sneaky and cautious, so it was treated as a red flag. So things like that, references like that, and more points down the line of references and previous stories and previous things mentioned by Brenner of how he threatened to kill uh, Dylan Round's father way back in the past. Red flag, early warning sign, right? A lot of backstory as well. And additional information tying in with the outcome of Dylan Rounds, which may have been found out at the very beginning of the case, like what June says here, and it remained since. But it was only talked about publicly months or a year later. So you could say that the family dragged out information on the Dylan Rounds case, but maybe it's because they felt that it wasn't as important, those points, as what the points were mentioned in the East Idaho News interviews at the beginning. Does that make sense? So you can say realistically the original story and everything that supposedly happened and talked about and then talked about months or a year later, which was already heard or known of at the start, dragged out still it happened back then and it, some of it's remained consistent yeah hopefully that makes sense to people like from my perspective is 
quite a bit that's been talked about of, um, you know, important areas that have been men- <coughs> mentioned, more so 2023 onwards. Yeah, 2023 onwards up to 2024. Important aspects which weren't mentioned at the beginning, but later, and they were still very important. And those haven't really switched or changed. The Gun and Key Fob is a very good example of things switching and changing in the early stages, of course. Um, and then the, um, as for the trailer part, was it parts, yes or no? Was it back and forth that? A little bit, but more so on the outside where people are claiming it wasn't and that it, it wasn't, Dylan. But do I just agree with this initial point by June that normally... The first few things that are mentioned are the truth, and then everything after that becomes Chinese whispers, escalates, and gets worse. I'd say I agree, June, to an extent, that you got the original story, the original people on the case, not many outsiders, right? Things are told, this is in place, that's happened, this occurred. And then everybody else jumps on in, who thinks they know more, or decides to reach out to other contacts in the background who aren't directly assigned on the case, but seem to know stuff. And then the the rumours and the talk builds, and it's in parallel to the ongoing inside investigation, which causes the grinding and tension, as I said. So, yeah, as soon as the case got more eyes from the public, that was the beginning downfall of it. I mean, look at the case nowadays. It's dead, Right? The Dylan Rounds case on YouTube is dead and flat. But is there as much trouble now? No. So if you had about 300 people, three to 500 people watching on a regular basis, such as my channel, it seems okay, doesn't it? But everywhere else, it seems a bit of a problem. So if the Dylan Rounds case unfolded right here, right now, as if it just happened now and not back then, with this set number of people watching, it probably wouldn't be as chaotic, right? I mean... It might sound rude to say, but this is just my opinion, whether you agree or not. I just think that when it comes to the Dylan Rounds case, if it was such a situation where it was only me covering it because it just wasn't popular in other people's eyes, I don't think it would be as much of a headache to try and understand the case. I think with the additions of all the other people coming on in, but more so audiences as well, outsiders, they've added to the confusion or the the trouble, right? Because sure, Candice Cooley has made mistakes. Others say she's outright lied. I don't know what other people think of that, but, you know, I can do a separate video about that at some point. But yeah, at the start, there were some things told as for the story, and they've remained solid since. Not everything, though. But I do feel, though, that with time, more stuff came out from the family, from the insiders, right? The important people tied in the case, which more groundbreaking stuff was mentioned later. So um, I think it is mixed. Robert. What was in the package that was attempted to be delivered to Independence Valley as eyewitness? Addressed to who? For what purpose? Might define what contents were, are. I've seen this comment by Robert before, but um, it's just a bit interesting. A bit, I don't know. I'm just going. Now, Sun's comment. Not seen Sun around often, so it's good for them to pop in. And it does look like they've got a long comment. So, uh uh-oh, there we go. Is it longer than Skepticals? It might be. So let's begin reading. Sun says, Hi, Warlike Ref. Who stated that blood was found at Don Hatley's property? Well, the answer to that is unknown. Quintessential Organics mentioned it just recently, but even he can't remember where it came from. Okay. If anyone does know, leave a comment down below. Now, Sun continues to go on and say, if it's a rumour, it should be squashed after a full investigation. But you bring up an important theory. One would think LEFBI would have already searched Don Hatley's with a fine tooth comb, cadaver dogs, etc. Since we have been told Breno went there the day Dylan disappeared. Okay, yeah, for the barbecue. Breno going to the barbecue on the same day as Dylan's disappearance. And left his firearms with Don. Was that all on the same day though? I thought 
the firearms were passed on to Don once the family got down there. Correct me if I'm wrong. I just thought there was a bit of a, a delay in between. Like, um, Brenner wasn't anticipating the family coming down that quick. And then when it did happen, Brenner was like, oh, I best pass them on so the police don't start investigating the scene of the crime and then find the firearms on me. So I thought that did happen a few days later. But nevertheless, Sun says, if Brenner had blood on his hands, wouldn't it be on the firearms too? This creates so many questions. So to be honest, um, there might have been blood on the firearm, especially if it was on his hands. But to be honest, um, you'd be holding the gun first. Let's say you Brenner, you're taking out Dylan. You hold the gun, you, you shoot, then Dylan is taken out from that. Maybe the firearm didn't get blood at that point. It was after, once Brenner started moving Dylan, possibly. the Hence the blood on Brenner, to that extent. And then with the blood being on Brenner, it started going on to other things and objects, anything that Brenner touched, right? So how much trace is there? As for prints, all about blood prints, I wonder. But not much was mentioned there, was there? The firearm... You know, whichever firearm it was, the murder weapon hasn't been found. And I don't think that firearm, either in that time-lapse footage, so that may have been disposed of properly, just like Dylan, right? So I can't really come to a conclusion of whether the firearm had blood on or not. But you'd think so if Brenner was already bloodied and then started handling stuff, it would pass on to things, such as you'd think that Brenner's trailer door would have blood on as he's opening the handle to get on in and maybe blood on Dylan's phone as well but to be honest since the phone was thrown into the pond the blood would have been washed off and before that the time-lapse footage of 7.27am depicted Brenner cleaning a gun cleaning it off blood maybe cleaning it off prints likely and Justin Rounds added an extra detail because he saw the footage himself. Now, it's not been mentioned by anyone else. It was only mentioned by Justin in the East Idaho News interview, I think, 3rd of March onwards, 2023. And Justin said that besides Brenner with blood on his hands, on his sleeves, on his shirt and cleaning a gun, he did go to the sink to wash his hands, which had blood on as well. So just an extra little detail there, which is interesting because it was only Justin that mentioned that point. No one else did. So, yeah, I can imagine washing the blood off and everything. So by the time you've washed off and cleaned up, you'd be wondering, well, then how does blood end up at Don Hatley's trailer then? That's why it doesn't make sense, does it? If you're in the trailer, you're washing yourself up, you're cleaning yourself down... I would assume that Brenner changed clothes in that trailer on the day before going to Don Hatley's place. Going to Don Hatley's place dressed the same way, covered in blood, would seem a little bit odd, wouldn't it? But, you know, not really heard any information on that. Did Brenner change clothes on the day before going to Don's, yes or no? Did he still have blood on him, which then led to blood being smeared onto Don's trailer when Brenner came round, yes or no? But one thing that seems to be for certain is that Brenner was cleaning himself up or cleaning the firearm down and his hands off blood and prints, right? So you'd think he'd do the same thing with his shirt or his face, anywhere where there could be blood, so that he he looks more presentable and there's less concern or question from Don when Brenner visits later. So that would rule out the blood, wouldn't it? If Brenner's cleaned, how else would blood end up on the trailer of Don's? Unless, and it sounds silly, if Brenner, on the same day or the next day, with or without the assistance of Don, took Dylan's body up to Don's place and somehow the desecration took place there, hence why there was a bit of blood on the side of the trailer, that's all I can think of. Let me know your thoughts down below. Um, but let me just continue reading Sun's comments, okay? So, if Brenner had blood on his hands, wouldn't it be on the firearms too? Hmm. This creates so many questions. Where is Don? Is he a material witness? Why the mysterious silence? So, where is Don? Don Hatley 
is in Casper City, Wyoming. Okay? That's the last what we heard of him. He went over that way to stay with family. Justin Rounds at some point on Facebook said to Don, you know, if I have to come on down to your place, I will, and I will spill your guts. Literally, or just make him confess. That would highlight that Don does play a major role in the case of Dylan Rounds and maybe with Brenner. For Justin to be so angry with Don and over time on and off, there must be some trigger points. There must be uh, a motive as to why Justin has it in for Don, even though other people don't. Even Candice Cooley doesn't really. So does Justin know something no one else does? Right? That's why there's the questions and mystery around Don Hartley. Anything else? I think his property should have been one of the first ones searched because allegedly Brenner went there, stopped at the pond beforehand, dropped the phone in, was found there. Did Brenner stop to the wash near to the pond? Because it's in parallel. We don't know. If in fact Ellie has evidence of an existing phone video, where was Brenner filmed washing? In his trailer or the pond, if they haven't searched Don Hatley's, they should. Right, so son, if you're referring to the existing phone, Dylan's, if, if you're referring to Brenner being caught on camera washing up, cleaning his hands, cleaning the gun, the firearm, that was all in Brenner's trailer at 7.27am in the morning. Hours later, that's when the phone was disposed of on the way to Don Hatley's because it's in the same direction as where Brenner was going, so he stopped on by. Hopefully that clears that up. What baffles me is why is it taking so long to get this case to court? Lack of evidence or the FBI waiting to grab others involved? We know Chase was rearrested with over a million dollar bond, right? The fairies. Why don't they want Dylan out there? Number one, water, more valuable than gold. What other landowners would have been damaged by Dylan's use of water? See who was downstream from Dylan. Number two, what could Dylan witness out there? Or what did Dylan already know about the drug movement or trafficking of illegals through that corridor into Utah and Idaho and points beyond? Is that airport between Dylan's and Don Hatley's? No. Well, it, it kind of is in between, but... It's not like in the centre, it's more off to the right, so it's it's off on the right. So I guess you wouldn't say it's in between, really, it's not in the middle of it. Um, I mean, as for the theory number one, there were previous people in the area, back in the past, that would, you know, had farms or pivots, crops, and were somewhat successful way back then. But then after that, it went very quiet and silent. Is that because of the presence of the whole uh, water situation and conflict? From what Candice Cooley had said, that people were grateful for Dylan Rounds, for Dylan allowed other ranchers or farm owners, landowners, to walk their cattle up to a spot so they could get water, and Dylan allowed that. So it strengthened the community and relations with one another in a positive way, so maybe that isn't the key factor here. Dylan witnessing stuff he wasn't supposed to. Maybe there's a chance. Maybe. What else? For some reason, I suspect Dylan disappeared over water rights. Is it possible that someone did not want Dylan Rouse using the large amount of water that would be needed to farm that parched earth? Follow the water table, make a map of all water users connected downstream. Fair point. But at least somehow the story's been told originally that no one had it in for Dylan there and that most people were grateful and um, appreciative of Dylan when it came to the water rights. The question. Does Don Hatley have a well? Is Hatley a downstream user? Would Dylan's use of water have affected Don Hatley's well, water volume? What else would have been affected by Dylan's usage of water? If there's anyone that wants to answer these questions by son, feel free to answer them down below under this video in the comment section. That would be appreciated. I don't know about Don Hatley having a well or not. I do remember the talk of a well somewhere 
and something to do with Kurt Wadsworth and something to do with where Dylan could be at, but it was filled in or something. I'm sure some people can um, add on from that. We know there is an ongoing war to war, according to TC. Who's TC? Ty Corbin. It's all a mountain of questions and they may be totally off base, but every time you bring this case up, I hear water. Okay. After listening to Kurt Wadsworth's last interview with Shaq Lady, saying how fed up Dylan was from his failing attempt to fix his water line, which was cut about every six to ten foot, his sabotage tractors, etc. Maybe the kid just gave up and split to raise substances in Murder Mountain, Humboldt County, California. Who knows? Thanks, Warlight Wrath, for causing a re-evaluation headache. Ha! <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Well, I've never heard about the track being sabotaged, but I've just not listened into the, the interviews over there. But, okay. Tractors being sabotaged. Are you saying that Dylan Round's tractors were sabotaged? By who and why? What's the whole point of that? If Dylan is in such a desolate, low-populated place, who would be sabotaging his tractors out there in that distance and terrain? Who could be bothered to do that? Sounds very petty. As for moving away to grow drugs in Murder Mountain. I mean, come on, the name of Murder Mountain, that sounds a little bit dodgy, doesn't it? Considering this is a, a murder true crime case and Dylan decides to go over that way. Is there enough proof? Not seen any proof of it, but I've seen a few comments here and there referring to it about growing alternative things, but elsewhere in a different state. I mean, I, who came to that idea conclusion in the first place? It just sounds very far-fetched, but it is what it is. What else? This person, my comments keep disappearing in the live chat. Not quite sure there. But you know what YouTube can be like. It's weird. I mean, I've seen it where some people in the live chat has left a comment and then suddenly it says comment redacted or comment deleted. And I'm just assuming that it's the people that posted the comments first and then thought, no, I made a mistake, I'll delete it and then type up a new one. But, you know, YouTube seems to be very dodgy at, at the best. So random stuff does happen. So besides reaching the end of the comments here, one last thing to acknowledge would be, um, like with the super chats and the super stickers, a few people last night were saying how they weren't able to do it, that like the super chats and super stickers weren't working for everyone, whether that be on mobile or on the computer. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Is YouTube trying to screw people over once again? Maybe. Wouldn't surprise me there. But just as a heads up, if you do want to support the channel, there are always alternative ways. And if they do work or if you are able to, that'd be appreciated. As example on screen right now, you got the link if you want to join and become a member on this channel where you receive exclusive badges, emojis and priority and responses and slash or you've got the alternative super chat super sticker and it is anonymous so if you want to be dodgy you want to be very dodgy money laundering maybe not quite like that but you get what i'm saying you want to be dodgy or you want to keep you know um low key you don't want people to know that you're here or there well there's a link there all under control if you want to click on it feel free to do so so I don't know what is going on with YouTube. Maybe it's another problem, another error. It's typical, isn't it, right? It's weird. But just as an additional heads up, if people weren't aware, when it comes to PayPal, the percentage cut, what PayPal gets from a super chat, let's call it that, would be, what is it, 1.7 to like 3.9%. But on YouTube, it's a 30% cut. That's how extreme it is on YouTube, in case you were wondering. So YouTube would get 30% of a super chat or super sticker. But on PayPal, PayPal would only get 1.7 to 3.9% of that money sent to someone. So 
Obviously, PayPal are a lot more lenient and more kind. YouTube are a bit greedy. But, you know, I guess it's because YouTube does provide a lot of tools and services on the platform if you're a creator. So maybe the money goes towards that, maybe. But I just wanted to give you a heads up as for alternatives. Now, with that all being said and done, let's move on. So I do believe that there's no harm in doing a dedicated map analysis video of Don Hatley's place of living, or supposed place of living, and then tying it in with the events following up to Brenner going on down there. Instead of telling the whole story all, of, all over again, just focus on the point going on after that. And I, I, know how it's, I know how it can work now. I can use the previous map projects if they're still available, if there's still the timestamps and phone pings of when this happened and that happened and when the phone was disposed of, even though the odd time stamp may differ from one to the other, you know, like the 2.51pm and then the 3.41 or something around that, two different timestamps of when the phone was dumped into the pond still annoys me to this day because I don't know which one is the, the real truth, right? When looking at, who's it now? Mob Crew Chris, his original timeline is 3.41 or onwards when the phone was in the pond, right? 2.51 is what we got from another discussion and how it was mentioned with time. So I don't know which one's true. It's It seems to switch and change and it's just kind of annoying. If anyone can you know, clarify or clear it up, that would be appreciated. Unless 2.51 was the time where, when uh, Brenner left and went on. But then, wasn't there a timestamp of something like 1.30? Or 2.30? Yeah, wasn't, wasn't like one, like, just in round saying something like 2.30pm is when Brenner decided to then leave. Uh, and, and but then I've got two fifty one being the phone at the pond. I mean, it kind of makes sense from two thirty leaving to then go up to Don's place and going up to the pond first of all. The time passing by would make a bit more sense. But the other one, three forty or so onwards, it seems like there's a big gap in between. What what would you be doing to get from here to there? It doesn't take that long, so that's that's what needs to be looked at. If we can't get a conclusion immediately, then I'll just have to make do with the timestamps that we've got. But a dedicated video on Don's place to tell the story and the importance, you know, the importance behind the place. Um, a follow-up to the importance of this video of Don's place, the importance told in a visual way. Today it was done in text narration, but why not put it into the visual perspective on Google Earth? I can do that next time, but I want it to be a, a separate video so it's more focused because um, today it's been a, a range of discussions once again and it's generated interest as we've seen within some of the comments. Um, so there's that. And then after that, because of the, the times of everything, can do a separate standalone video after that of the Dually truck. My thoughts on it, where could it have gone, which direction it turned in, and why was it there in the first place? Just my thoughts there, questions, probably more so questions than answers, just so you're ready and braced for that. So these are like key events of what happened or key locations of where things did happen, which I need to look into and I can analyze. So be on the lookout for those videos. But what I wanted to talk about just now is to finish what I originally started from the last video and that's to do with rants, okay? I've seen it with time. More so outsiders, and a few viewers on my channel that may have come and gone and the odd ones may have remained but they've been dealt with since. It's just people out there jump to the conclusion and assume and label my videos as being rants, okay? Whether it be to do with analysing a situation, drama, a person, conflict, they visualise and falsely label it as a rant. When I've done responses in the name of the Dylan Rounds case or a case in general and I've been either defending myself when I've covered something or defending something else, people see that defensiveness as a rant. 
but they're all invalid claims and there's just not enough evidence to prove that, right? Once again, it's humans out there that like to use their fancy uh, tags, handles, uh, labels, quirky wording to make it seem like that they know it all and they're discrediting somebody else. And what's actually happening is their lack of interest into something, they're justifying it by labeling it as that when it's not exactly true. Maybe there's an alternative reason as to why they don't like it, but they can't think of the word to describe it at the time, right? I mean, the people that falsely label my videos and titles as being clickbait, even though the thumbnails are fully explainable and the um, the, uh, the the titles the titles themselves will have question marks in, right? It's not claiming anything as a fact. It's just simply saying that, could it be this? Could it be that? Is it really true? It's not for definite, but people don't look at it that way. So then they falsely label it as clickbait and that's that's rubbish, it's slander, it's invalid what they've said. They've made an idiot of themselves but they've tried attacking someone unjustly. The only reason why they've come to that conclusion is because they don't like the video because they feel like they've been lied to but they just simply looked at the text, looked at the thumbnail before clicking and understand it a bit better, they would know what to expect when watching the video. But people don't do that, they rush in. So that's on their end, it's their fault, simple as. So is it their fault if they label my videos as being a rant? Well, is anyone to blame there? I mean, it's not as slanderous, right? Just saying, oh, I don't like this because it's a rant. Oh, are you doing another rant again? Now, when that stuff happens, it's not like a slanderous claim. It's just like an opinion of someone more. So it's not as damaging. So no one's really at fault to that degree. But if you're talking about an invalid point, well, yeah, it is an invalid point. And I just want to explain it right now, okay? So what is the definition of a rant? It, it seems to be along the basis of it could be an argument between people or a singular individual talking about something, but in a, an aggressive, maybe negative way and driven by passion. An ongoing monologue, would you call it that? Or an ongoing dialogue? I mean, it'd be a monologue, wouldn't it? Because it's one person. Yeah, I'm sure it's that way, monologue. It's an ongoing thing which which seems where, where it feels like it's just going on and on and on and it won't stop. Does that make sense? And it could be considered in kind of a negative way. So um, apologies if the flow is a little bit disrupted. I'm getting distracted by silly things outside. So let me just um, make sure I don't knock the curtain this time because last time it, it knocked the phone. Okay, so apologies about that. It does annoy me when there are distractions about my definition, besides the official one of anger when talking and driven by passion in a certain way, you know, we're looking at it a bit deeper because sometimes definitions can be very short and um, kind of clear but lacking in depth, right? My interpretation of a rant is an ongoing talk which seems to just go on and on and drag on maybe the tone of the voice, it's grating, a little bit aggressive, not stopping to breathe, just going round and round, maybe repetitive as well, and on the basis of a negative theme or topic and the response and the voice somewhat negative. And what, what value is there? How meaningful is it? Rants aren't always that meaningful towards others. It's just more of an expression of oneself releasing their energy or releasing what's on their mind. That's kind of a rant. So if it builds up within somebody and then they choose to talk and open up about it, the pressure may have built, they may have had enough, they've reached a breaking point, they've had enough of something or someone, so they lay it all out and they talk on and on and it tends to be negative, right? or if someone's defending a sport, a football, a club, that could be a rant. It's very passionate, it's very outgoing, and they're expressing themselves. Is a rant a bad thing always? No. 
but some people just don't like it. They don't want to listen to a rant. It's not of their interest, but it is with some. Now, when applying it to me, there's no rants, right? There's people from the past, okay? There's people from the past that labelled me as a ranter. Strangers, some family members, and the odd of a person who I know of. False claims, invalid. Now, I could say the prats, knobs, not quite thinking clear, but it was never said in a negative way. Let's just make that clear. It was more in a joking way, some of those people, right? People in real life, like family members. Oh, <laughs> you're doing another rant. Not meant in a negative way. They're just joking about. But nowadays, I take it more serious when I'm defending myself, my channel. It's not happened since, but if it did, Regardless of who it is, I would defend myself, okay? We're not ranting, we're making valid observations, important, interesting discussions, providing depth and meaning behind it, right? If you want to say that my negative analysis, my negative predictions and criticising the human race for their behaviour, the personalities, what they've done, what they do wrong, how dark and evil, manipulative and nasty people are, like my old videos, like how people from the past in real life and online have labelled me as ranting back then, there is still depth behind it and more so more now than ever. I mention negative points I mention criticisms about humans, valid points, but I talk most of the time in somewhat of a slow, calm tone. The complete opposite to a rant, which is very passionate, aggressive, and, you know, like right in there in terms of the pace, talking fast, not breathing, going on and on and on. It's not like that. Even back in 2014, 2015, when I was talking about negative things and dark things with humans, and that was labelled as a rant, I was making valid observations, a key discussion. It's just that no one could be bothered to watch at the time because no one really knew of me. So it was just, you know, I was talking to a brick wall, right? So it seems like I'm having a go, I'm on a rant, but it was valid discussions like how it is now, but there's an audience now and there is a response and there is a feedback. So it's not just me talking to a brick wall, I'm talking to people that are watching and I'm referring back to people's comments, right? There's more interaction now than there was back then. So now it's seen as less of a rant and more of an ongoing dialogue between one another in a formal, controlled, calm way. But if in the past, you're the only person talking, that is seen as a rant. You're not allowing anyone else to talk. It's all about you and you're expressing yourself. But there's nothing I could do back then because I just didn't have an audience. That's not my problem. I was just doing my videos as I do. And those what I did back then are what I'm doing exactly now. That's why I don't mind doing them because I know exactly what I'm doing, right? And uh, with people actually watching now, it does help. And there's more meaning behind it now than there was back then because people can take notes from this and learn, right? Rants, you don't really learn or take much from it. You just listen to someone going on and on and on. It's more about the person talking, releasing their own energy than the person listening. Though sometimes people can relate if they want to blow off steam, they'll listen to somebody else blowing off steam. So there's positives from rants, but it, that just doesn't happen here right? And before we go any further, it just, <laughs> invalid points, okay? I'm closing my eyes because <laughs> humans, whoa, silly billy people at times, low IQ at times, or they portray, them, portray themselves like that, okay? Their job title, their job role, their place in society might be quite well or high up there, but in terms of in here, you wonder how they got there, right? When it comes to common sense, but as I said, people from the past, 
you know, random strangers online saying that I'm ranting. The odd person who I knew of, such as Nina, also known as the Cat Lady, you would have seen her on this channel here and there, and in recent time on YouTube, Nina, saying how I'm ranting, or, oh, you're doing another one of your rants, lol. We're not messing about. We're doing serious observations. Hopefully you understand that, Nina. And when it's come to some family members joking about, which is all fine, no problem, but show a level of respect that would be appreciated. Where it's someone I know, or some stranger, show some respect, okay? Now, this is the clever thing. I could go on and on and call out people, but what does that do? It's the self-fulfilling prophecy in which what people labelled me as, I am now turning into. I'm not going to allow that here. So some little chess manoeuvres, people are wanting me to fall into that trap. That's not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. You can try, big boy. Not going to work. So, adding on from what I was originally saying, discussions, ongoing discussions and analysis now are of people's interest because people continue to watch. Others may drop off, but it's because they see it in the wrong light. They think it's a rant, but it's not. It might not be of their interest, okay, but for them to say it's a rant, that's an incorrect statement and an invalid observation, okay? Because the definition of a rant doesn't tie in with my videos here. If you wanted to use as an example of me going on and on with my different voices, accents, and calling out Watcher of Crazy, or Betty Hayward, or Mr. Impetuous, or the soggy individual, right? That's always in a light-hearted way. It might be repetitive, it might be fast-firing, it might sound a little bit of, a, of aggression, but it's all like made up, like the claims, the references, the examples, it's all done in a light-hearted way. It could be interpreted as a rant, but when people know it's a skit, like a funny moment, kind of like comedy, entertainment, it's not real, it's not a real rant. So it's invalid, right? If we're applying it to genuine normal videos like this one and past ones, even if it did speed up in my voice or raised my tone here and there, it's not a rant. It's done as a psychological means of highlighting a point, making a word bold so it stands out, so people are listening and there is a level of attention and focus. Because if you talk in a monotone voice all the way through, right, some points may get swept under the rug and not acknowledged. But if I'm talking like this and then suddenly I'm like, but we need to acknowledge this right? It's suddenly, it's like, whoa, okay, we're now introducing something new to the conversation. I said, a conversation, right? So, yeah, now, because there is an audience and people watching, and I'm talking and I'm responding, that level of interaction, it's not, it's not seen as a rant now by as many people. But still, there's misinformed, ignorant individuals along the way, and impetuous ones, like how there was in the past, but it is what it is, okay? But what I would say is there is more meaning to these videos than rants, as I said, and there's more takeaway points here than there would be in a rant. My analysis, my observations and my predictions have led to people listening in, taking notes, applying it in life or online, and preventing themselves from getting hurt compared to what happened to them previously. People have adapted through watching my videos. People have been somewhat better off from listening to my videos. That would be considered a positive thing. There is meaning behind the videos. There is meaning behind this voice and what's said. There is a purpose. A rant is an directionless, almost erratic pace of just talking and releasing everything. We're not just releasing everything here. We're opening it up, we're shedding light on a point, a topic, making sense of it, trying to figure out why it happens or what caused it, and then working on a solution to it, to fix it, to get rid of it, or to adapt in the presence of it. 
that's how formal it really is. The more formal, the more structured, the slower the pace, the variety of tone of voice and level of focus and the meaning and depth behind it is far from a rant. So all of the delusional people over time that have said that I rant or my videos are a rant are just very ignorant people. Shame on them. Rewatch, rethink, revise, and next time think before you speak or type. Simple as. All under control here, okay? Luckily though, well, it's not luckily because the people that are present on a regular basis, most of them, or a fair portion, are good people. Let's just take into consideration that within recent time elsewhere, some more, or, the, or a fair portion at that point, who do watch, did show their true colours and their toxic side. I've not forgotten that and I will never forget that, okay? But as for the regulars from the Dylan Rounds community, all fine there, which is obviously good to see. So I think we'll leave it there. I'm glad I was able to, you know, put this point in from the last video because I, I couldn't go into as much depth then because of time and everything, but I have done now. And there is a new video project and idea that can be applied next time, which I'd say about two to three more videos to do after this one. And there's a clearer direction now. So next time it could be the map analysis and importance of Don's place then a map analysis of the mystery of the jewelry truck, and then the third one can be looking back at comments, but as well mentioning the Candice Cooley just in round situation of how there was a bit of a lose-lose situation. I'll make sure to note them down so I don't forget. So thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye and good night for now.